people buy on emotion and justify with logic. That's the first thing. So people will make a buying decision often in a heartbeat. And you know, I'm sure you guys, if when you've met a client, uh, you've got some, you walk in the door and you go, yeah. <laughs> and then you've got other ones, you walk in the door and you go, yeah, I know. Episode 111. This is The Business of Architecture. Hello, Architect Nation. I'm Enoch Sears, and this is the show where each week I speak with a successful architect, designer, or consultant to discuss tips, strategies, and secrets for running a profitable and impactful architecture practice. Today's show is sponsored by BQE Software, the makers of ArchiOffice. ArchiOffice is the office and project management software built with the needs of architects in mind. And for a limited time, startup firms can get two free seats of ArchiOffice for a year. Go check it out at ArchiOffice.com. When you speak to the folks over at BQE Software, please mention this show. Because when you use ArchiOffice, you support Business of Architecture, which allows me to continue bringing you this content. Today is part two of my interview with Frank Aldridge. Frank is an expert in project management, procurement, and negotiating. He's going to share with us secrets about winning projects during the RFP process, including his right track workshop technique that you can use to get paid for what most people do for free and will help you land hundreds of thousands of dollars in design fees if you implement it correctly. So with that, here's today's show. So give us an overview of the right track workshop. I know you've already given us a little bit overview and then let us know how people who are interested can find out more about this because I know that you have prepared uh, a virtual training who architects who are interested in this concept and putting this into their business can actually get that. So tell us a little bit more about what it is and and then tell us sure. how, you know, where they can find out more about it. Yeah, so um, the, the first thing that, um, so there, there's a number of steps we go through. So the, the first thing I give the, the people that are going to attend a briefing note and the briefing note just sets out, hey, here's the background to what we're doing. Um, here's what we think the objectives are. And then uh, then we'll go through a stakeholder analysis. And like we've worked out a really fast way of doing this. It takes about, you know, that part takes five or 10 minutes. Um, and out of the stakeholder analysis comes a communications plan. And again, we've developed a, a one page spreadsheet, which, you know, we used to do like, 20 page communications plans, no one ever read them, they were useless. And so, um, you know, I'm sort of inherently lazy. So I came up with a way of doing this in one page and, and it gets used. Um, so the briefing note says, this is what we're going to cover. Here's, here's what we think the objectives of the project are. Here's um, a stakeholder, we're going to do a stakeholder analysis. So you need to be thinking about the stakeholders. Then we're going to do a risk analysis and what I've found is most people are really useless at risk analysis. Um, you know, I've trained hundreds and hundreds of people and they all think they're good. And when you get to the risk analysis part, you really find out if they are any good. And then normally the answer is no. Mm -hmm. um, so we show them a good way of doing that. And in the briefing note, we'll talk about who the stakeholders are and um, what they need to think about in terms of who they are so that they can be... Um, so when they come into the workshop, they've already had to think about the, the next thing we'll do is uh, in the briefing note is about um, risk analysis. And this is where we typically find people aren't actually very good. So we've given them a, a structured way to look at risks. We've given them some prompts and uh, and then we'll frame it up in the workshop itself. The the other elements we do in there, are, the first one is a needs and, needs and wants analysis. And... We'll, we'll be using this later on, and I'll talk more about the elements uh, in a minute. But um, and this is probably probably the hardest part to do in the actual workshop. But once you've done a few, it's actually pretty easy. Um, and then the other things we want them to think about is uh, who's going to be on the project team, and and governance. Who's going to sign off uh, various elements of the the project? So um, with a, I'll talk about all those elements in a second. But we give them the briefing note. Do they always read it? No, typically more often <laughs> they don't. Um, and I've had one client, they're a museum, and, and when we did that one, everyone read it, you know, because they were sort of academics and they'd all done their homework. That's but funny. typically they don't read it, right? But what that does is it means you've got something to talk to when they first come in the room. 
And so did you all read the briefing note? Uh, blank looks, no, yes, one did. So even if it was a, um, a family that you're dealing with, it's important for them to think about these things. And it also, you know, to create one of these for you, um, we'll give you a template uh, and they, they only take a few minutes to create once you've got the template it makes you look really professional. Man, these guys know what they're doing. You know, look at this briefing note. We've never had one of these before. So then you come in. And so I'll just talk through the elements, if you like, in, of the of the actual workshop itself and then how we use them. So uh, the first thing, it's really important always to bring up the background, even if you think everyone in the room knows what it is, because the reality is they don't. And, and this is where a lot of the problems come is that people think they understand what's going on, but in reality they don't. So so I'll cover off the background. And and man, we are now 3M's biggest client. Eh? We use um, 3M flip chart paper. We use uh, 3M post-it notes. In fact, my guys at work have actually just sent them a little promo thing of us and the amount of 3M stuff we use to say, hey, look, how about sponsoring us? Um, but so we get the big... Uh, flip chart, 3M paper, and I have this prepared, so it's already written up, and I just stick it on the wall. Here's the background. Is there anything to add to that? And they go, oh, yeah, there's this other bit. Yeah, cool. So now everyone understands where we're starting from. The other thing is I'll also have in my notes, I'll have put what I think are the objectives for the project, and the other thing I'll do is I'll put that on a flip chart too. And typically your objectives are, first of all, my first ones always have fun because no matter what's going on, particularly in business, um, it might not, or not, might not necessarily be fun, <laughs> and so um, the uh, the other saying for that, and I got this off a, a guy from the states years ago, is how can we turn the lemon into lemonade? You know, so when things are going wrong, how can we turn the lemon into lemonade? The next objective for me is always to enhance our reputation. So that's the client, um, and you know, how can we enhance their reputation with their stakeholders, their clients, their whoever, you know, their community, whatever it is. And if you sort of start with those two, that's a very good, strong platform. And then the next one is normally, you know, to get the optimal mix of quality, time, and and um, money. That's normally what projects are about, quality, time, and money. So how can we get the best mix of those? And then they can come up with a couple of others. But um, even tomorrow or Monday where I'm going into the workshop, though I've already prepared it all, that's all the flip charts are ready to go. There's the background. Here's the here's the objectives, and then we get them to agree those objectives and sign off on them. So now that's the objectives for the project, and every document we do for the project from here on in has those in it, right at the front. Here's the little bit of background of the project. Here's the objectives. So that way we've got them focused all the time on where we're trying to go because the objectives are end goals, and then then we'll do the stakeholder analysis and. And this is all done with flip charts and post-it notes and I split them up in little groups. And, and even if you just had a family with, um, you know, a husband and wife, for instance, I would still get them to do this together. And it identifies who the stakeholders are um, right at the outset and really makes them think about it. But the analysis also works out who is important and who's not so important in terms of stakeholders. You know, if you're dealing with a, a client, you can't be – consulting with everyone in their business every day, that's just not possible. But you might want to consult with the CEO every day or the property manager, you know, or the building manager while you're going through your project with them. And so that sort of works that out. And then from that, we put that into a, um, a one-page spreadsheet communications plan that I've developed. And it just means that uh, you can see, you know, who you need to communicate with, how you're going to do it, why you're going to do it, when you're going to do it all at a glance and it's proven to be very effective and they use it whereas the stuff we used to do they don't use it so then the risk analysis another flip chart post-it note exercise and and we've also worked out how to facilitate these things how to make them work really well uh, how to break down those communication barriers in in the client's organization you know the the finance people aren't talking to anyone else and that sort of thing because we get them all working together on these and and so there's some sort of tips and tricks that we've learned over the last 18 months on how to do those uh, more and more effectively. And out of that, you'll get a risk register. Then the next thing is the needs and wants. Like I said before, this is probably the hardest thing to do, but it's actually pretty easy once you've done a few. And and 
because once you've done a few, they typically always come out the same. And so for one of your clients, the, you know, it may be that you need to, with a family, you might be talking about, you know, what do you really need and want out of this new house? Oh, well, you know, oh, we want uh, natural light. We want good indoor outdoor flow. Um, well, what about budget? Oh, your budget, yeah. What about timing? Yeah, well, yeah. So then you work out of those things, which is essential and which is um, important and which is more important than the other bits. Because if typically you say to them, hey, you know, what's essential? They say the lot. Well, no, well, you can't have that. So, and there's some little techniques as to how you get them to work out, you know, the rankings and that sort of thing. But, but what that does now, it lays the platform for all your decisions going forward. So if I'm running a, a bid process, um, this is the first thing I do at the start of that bid process. So the client is telling me, uh, this is important. This is absolutely critical. So we've got to have that. This is important, but that one's more important than that. So that we can then develop our questions and criteria and they're all around those. So when we evaluate the proposals, we're evaluating them against those so that we get the right answer. Because someone might be good at one thing and bad at the other. The next supplier might be bad at the first thing and good at the other. So which of those was the most important so we can get a winner? But the same applies for you when you're making decisions. Um, it may be that timing is critical. We've got to have this thing built before here. So when you get in a situation where you've got to make decisions, you come back to those um, criteria and you say, well, you told me that timing was the most important. Or it may be that budget is the most important. We've got to, this is all we've got. We can only spend this much. So we don't mind if it takes a bit longer, but we've got to, we can only spend that much. So um, with things like um, natural light, indoor outdoor flow, all those sort of things, if you get the family agreeing on those now in the cool light of day before it all gets emotional further down the track, you have much more clarity as to where the priorities are, but it also means you don't have those big fights later on where they're going, yeah, but no, this is more important, no, that's more important, but it's now because they've bought into something. You're getting them to make these decisions while they're still uh, clear in their thinking. So um, we found that that's really, really useful. And then the next thing is, you know, who needs to sign off on this? Well, in a family, that might be quite simple, but um, in a corporate situation, that might be, well, the board needs to sign off on it or the CEO needs to sign off on it or the general manager. Okay, and we've got this time frame to meet? Yeah, okay, well, that means that when we get to here, we need the CEO primed and available to sign that thing. Oh, how are they going to be away on holiday then? Okay, right, so... The project I'm running at the moment is um, uh, we started it in, in February and we're now into implementing it and uh, it was worth $300 million, the, the, the bid process for the winner, you know, um, not all margin obviously, but uh, for the $300 million worth of revenue. Um, and so we've got the whole thing, but that had to be signed off by council and so they only meet twice a month. So we had to line up our project so that, uh, and they need things like a week before the, the council meeting. So we had to have our decision made and signed off so that we had a week lead in going into that council meeting so we could get it signed off last Tuesday so that we can start the implementation next Monday. We couldn't, if you're waiting until you get down, oh hell, uh, so-and-so needs to sign that, we'd have, uh, we'd have missed it, we'd have been in big trouble. And I bet you've all seen them. I had it where, you know, you, you get a decision and then, oh, it's got to be signed off by the CEO. Oh. And it goes there and it sits on their desk for three weeks, you know, and the whole project gets held up. Um, and the other thing I just want to be clear on is who's on the team um, and we get that all nailed now. And that is the Right Track Workshop. So the outputs from it, a comms plan, clear set of objectives, signed off, uh, a risk register that we'll keep updating as we go through it, and a needs and wants analysis that gives us our criteria signed off. And um, and then, you know, who, who needs to be on the team and who's who has sign off points in the process. So lock all that down now. And and the rest is really easy after that. So what benefit does having a right track workshop type of offering um what benefit does that have for an architecture firm or for someone who's going after a contract or a client? I think um, a number of things. First of all, 
like my clients are using this in their bids now. So they're showing that they're a good safe option because they've got this thing. It's not just, oh, uh, when we start, we do a bit of a meeting. It's when we start, we have a right track workshop. In the right track workshop, we cover off all those things I've just talked about. Yeah. And in the right track workshop, out of that, you get, you know, a strong communications plan, you know, all those things. But also, um, it, uh, the benefits that AU get is yes, okay, we've now shown ourselves to be safe and knowledgeable, and here's how we'll do it. But it also means you've got a, a, a tool in your arsenal of products to offer for something like you can think of a number, but I typically have between one and two thousand dollars where I can just say to them, look, why don't we just do one of these? And it's an easy sale. Are you entering into this project? Why don't look, let's just do one of these. I'll show you how to do it as well. So A, we'll train you guys how to do it. So you can use it on other projects you do if you like. B, it'll set up your project really strong and sort out really, you know, when I go ahead and all that, it'll sort out whether you're serious. Um, and it just gives us a chance to work together, see if we like each other and trust each other. And, you know, and the other thing we add in there, Enoch, is on all our proposals, and it's on the back of my business card is, and we have a guarantee. And uh, what's the guarantee? Well, if you don't think you got value for money, you just pay what you think it was worth. So that's the clincher. They, how can they say no now? So they just go, oh, yeah, that, that sounds like a no-brainer, right? And so we can now lock that in. We've got our first step into this client. And um, so like, you know, we, we're doing this one with the inland revenue. So we've locked in, uh, just as recent as the last couple of days, we've locked in a right track workshop with them. And because they're now so convinced of that, because we've had to, you know, convince them of it, they're now locking in a an eight thousand dollar training workshop for we. I'm going to train these staff as well. So, <clears throat> so that's the first benefit. You've got a really good selling tool now, and it's easy and effective. The second benefit is most clients, um, uh, particularly corporate ones, have all these sort of silos. Do you call them silos in in the states, Enoch? <laughs> where different parts of the organization don't talk to other parts. The workshop, I break them up into small groups and make them work together. So suddenly the guy from finance is working with the guy from property and they're going, you know, he's actually not that bad after all. <laughs> he's actually quite a nice human. And they come away from there thinking, oh, that was quite good. And so it breaks down those um, those barriers. The other thing it does is it gets buy-in. So with the council project I'm doing at the moment, the very first workshop was to get them to buy into me, but to get the project going a little bit. Then they said, right, we'll now engage you. So it's now not $2,000. We're now going to engage you for $100,000. Beauty. So the first thing I did was then a, um, a workshop with the deputy mayor, a councillor, and four senior staff. So it was a right track workshop and we went through all of that. So then all those people signed off on the objectives and they signed off on the evaluation criteria. So that was the needs and wants and the relative weightings. So they're now signed off. So we could then take that to the council. So I didn't have to do a right track workshop for the council. We just had to take it to them and say, hey, here's what they said for objectives. Are you okay with it? And they just changed two words, done. Here's what they said for evaluation criteria and relative weightings. Are you okay with that? Yep. Done. Locked in. Now, so this is governance. So now said, righto, that's governance. You stay out of this until we're finished now. We'll go away and run our project based on those criteria. And when we come back with the preferred one, you will sign off because we'll have done it according to that. And so that way you didn't have any political inference. So in a corporate client, that can sometimes be the board. Um, you're not getting political interference from them. We get a clean run of our project based on that criteria. When we get to the end for sign-off, my report just says, you, you agreed to this, you agreed to that, here's what we've, we've come back with. They have no choice but to agree to that. So it meant that all our things go through the sign-off process just smooth. So it, get, it got that buy-in from those councillors and things because they were involved at the outset, the last thing you want to get is you get down to the end and go, gee, why did you pick those guys? You know, um, we really wanted something that did more of this. You know, and we've all had that. You know, that's 
all my things I've learned from battle scars, you know. So so we get that signed off at the start. Then you have that buy-in right from the start. So the other thing is this project I'm running at the moment is going to involve um, the client being a council. A whole lot of their staff are going to lose their jobs and they're going to go into a joint venture with the roading company. So it's going to be a new thing. So most of them will end up with a new job. So we have a team meeting with them and they're all, you know, arms folded and, so, you know, any questions? Eh, you know, nothing. <laughs> They're all standing there. No one wants to talk. Righto. Let's do the risk analysis part out of the right track workshop with all of you guys. And and I split them up into groups of about five people to do this. So I had to have seven flip charts, seven groups of five, get them going. Ten minutes, they're now all talking. They're now involved. They're now buying into the process because they're involved. They're not a spectator. They're involved in it. And so then they're all looking at it and um, coming up with risks that we hadn't thought of because they're looking at it from their view on life. Uh, things like, you know, gee, if I go over into this new thing, will, will my benefits still carry over? Uh, will I have to do more hours than I used to? Will I get paid as much? Will I get paid more? But will I be expected to do 60 hours a week? So those risks all came out that we hadn't thought of. So that makes our project more robust. So again, coming back to your original question, what do they get? They get better communications because you develop a communications plan out of it. They get much more robust, uh, robustness of around risks because you're you're developing the risks, looking at it from a whole lot of different people's point of view. Um, everyone on the team is buying into it because they're, they're involved from the outset. So they're involved, they'll buy into the outcomes. Um, you get better interaction between the team members. But the reason we were getting the balls dropped on these other projects was people who from other parts of the project, they know the day to day. They know what the building needs. They know how it works. They weren't involved. So when you go to implement it, they go, well, that's dumb. You know, uh, didn't you think about this? And the guys on the project team go, oh, no, we never thought of that. Um, so it makes you look stupid. Whereas this way, you just hardly get any of that sort of stuff going on at all because you, you've involved all those stakeholders early. Um, so it's sort of less gaps for balls to fall between, you know. And the thing is, because it's so fast, you do them in, a, in an hour or, or two, you know, depending on what model, um, the project is investing in that bit of time with a whole lot of people. And then, because one of my philosophies about projects and teams is the smaller the better. So I only want two or three people going forward, but I might have involved 15 in that original meeting. So we've got a robustness, but now I don't have to have 15 people all the way through. And that's what a lot of people do. They try and have 15 all the way through, and that's A, very uh, expensive, but B, very unproductive, because to try and arrange a meeting for 15 people is really hard, but to arrange a meeting for two people is really easy. So, um, and I guess it just means there's less surprises for people. You know, they they get to the parts of the project and They've all been made aware from the start, so you're not getting, oh, I didn't know about this, you know, and, and the blockages and the barriers that come out of that. So the fundamental is less stress, more success. You know, we, we had a guy um, come and train us once. He was a leading expert in the world on stress, and he said there's two things about stress. One is it'll make you miserable, and two is it'll make you die younger. And so everything we can do to reduce the stress uh, and make life sort of uh, better is is good, I think. Love so. It. Yeah, that's probably it in that respect, ain't it? <laughs> okay. Well, uh, just I had another thought. So when architects or when responding to RFPs, when we get or yep. you know request for qualification or what have you, a lot of times it's a scenario where we might not know the client that well. I know a lot of firms are you know they're considering responding to proposals where they don't have an existing relationship or they want to start that relationship. So that's mm -hmm. a very difficult process. Do you have any tips or pointers? Boy, you're getting a bargain today. You're getting my winning tenders uh, training for nothing. So yes, here? the answer is yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the answer is yes. And so the first thing I tell clients to do is write these three questions down and answer them. So um, as a business owner, what do you think those three questions that you need to ask when someone's asking you to bid? So the first one is, what is it going to cost me to respond to this? What's it going to cost me to respond? So um We've just helped a client respond to a big bid and they came second. Now, the phrase for that is there's no profit in coming second. 
um, you know, it's like sort of you're the bridesmaid. So yep. it cost them $80,000 to respond to this bid was the answer. Um, what is it for you? What is it for you for this project? So we've had anything from, and this is the cost of your time, the cost of engaging someone to help you maybe, maybe you have to engage your lawyers to check over contracts, whatever it is. Um, you need to know that number. So the next question is, what are my odds of success? So if they're just going out to the open market um, saying, hey, you know, bid on this thing, how many might respond? Is it two? Is it five? Is it 15? Is it 20? Because if it's 20, it's 5%, you know. Um, and I don't know what the answer to the first question is for you guys, but, um, you know, even for my company, it could be anything between five and, and twenty thousand uh, dollars of opportunity cost and all that sort of thing. So, um, what are my odds of success? So, if they've gone out to the open market, the odds are slim. Uh, then the next one is what do I get for a prize if I win? So sometimes it's just money. Sometimes it's money and some other things like a strategic reason to win it. Um, it might be that this is a nationwide operator and if you can get you know successful with one you might get a whole lot of others that you can now say hey we can supply nationwide operators or it might be that it'll be in a certain segment so my my sort of segment that I've done a lot of work on in the last sort of four or five years is councils um, and, and local authorities so uh, to get some work in there gave me some traction now I've worked for 19 or 20 it is at the moment Whereas those first couple were hard work because I didn't have any experience. But now, so there might be a strategic value in winning it. So once you've known those three answers, the first one, how much, what are my odds, what do I get if I win, you can sort of, oh, does this make sense? So my first advice to clients is, if it doesn't make sense, don't go after it. <laughs> and you've just saved yourself a, a whole lot of money because you weren't going to win anyhow. Uh, you were just going to waste your time. And I was, oh, yeah, but, you know, it gets our name out there. Well, hey, there's much more effective ways of getting your name out there than blasting tens of thousands of dollars at, at bids that you haven't got a chance of winning. Um, the other question I ask myself is how well are these bid documents or these tender documents written? And because this is part of my specialist skill, I can evaluate that and say, and the problem is most of them are poorly written. And what that means is if they can't, run their process properly or even write their documents properly, what chance have they got of choosing the right one? So you might be the best and they'll still choose someone else because they don't know how to do it. So most of mine go in the rubbish bin <laughs> um, because I would rather go after clients who I can get without bidding than clients that I have to bid for because it's an expensive, time-consuming, frustrating, uh, a good recipe to going broke. So that's my biggest advice to to you guys is unless you're really sure of this, don't go near them unless you know there's a good chance. The other thing is, are they doing a one or two stage process? So what I mean by that is they might do a simple registration of interest that takes no effort. So okay, we'll go for that because it's a few hours. Then from that, they're going to narrow it down to a short list of three. Now that's attractive because now I'm in with a 30% chance of winning. So now I'll have a go. And that's the way I run them myself, but a lot of people don't. So, you know, those are the sort of things I go to, to making that decision and um, how I go about looking at, looking at winning these things. So that's the biggest thing at the start. Okay, so that sort of, that sort of saves our hide if, if you know, Absolutely. that go, no-go decision. Um, yep. If, if we, there is a little bit of a chance that we see that we do want to move ahead any yep. any just quick tips about how to stand out from that process? I think you went over the Right Track Workshop, which I think is an excellent way yeah. to differentiate. Yeah, so you've now got um, that. And, and, you know, so the first question, I when I sit down with clients and do this stuff, the first question I say to them is those three. And then the next one is, so why would I pick you guys? You know, why would I pick you? If there's all these ones out there, what's important about you? So I get them to talk about their business to me and often I can pick up out of that things they don't even know because they've been doing this for so long, they don't even appreciate how good they are in a certain area. And I go, wow, that's good. Um, do you realize you're the only guys doing that a little bit? 
They go, no, I didn't know that. Oh, wow. And so you've got to work out why they would use you in preference to someone else. And then you need to explain that to them, but very succinctly. Um, so part of how do you distinguish yourself in, an area, uh, in, in responding to a proposal or, or a bid is you've got to write well. And this is where we help a lot of our clients is we show them how to write well and it's it's succinct, it's bullet points. We don't have big sentences, you know, telling us about how great they are and all that. We just have, here's the key areas we do, bang, 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 bullet points in order of importance. Then uh, this is why this is important to you, bang, 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 more bullet points. Because when they're reading them, those bullet points absorb into their brain. If they have a big sentence that doesn't absorb in, I sat next to a lady on a plane about a year ago, um, and she was very naughty. She was reading responses. <laughs> that was the first point. She was reading them, and I could read them as well, and they were banks mm -hmm. responding to a thing. Mm -hmm. And But the other thing is she was basically reading them about this fast. She was just turning them over going, yeah, yeah, oh, right a little thing. And she thought she was really clever. So she wasn't even reading what they'd written. And it's like, you know, these guys probably spent tens of thousands of dollars writing this stuff, and she thought she was really clever. She wasn't even reading it. So you have to make it really easy to read. Um, stick to the points. And then when you make a statement and what this means to you is, you know, we've been in business for 20 years. Again, what this means to you is we've had clients who keep coming back because we've proven ourselves with them. They trust us. We always do a good job with them. We're always safe. We make sure that we look after them. They don't drop the ball and they get a really good outcome. See, that's much more powerful than this saying we've been in business for 20 years. You know, and, and this is what's special about us. The other thing we do in ours is we, we um, come up with a pitch statement. And not all clients like this, but I do. Um, and it might only be in the actual document a couple of times, but it's um, – we did one where we were uh, bidding for a big contract and we had no relationship with these guys and it was uh, um, with the government and it was in the area of, area of bio, biosecurity and it was all about training development and stuff in biosecurity. And in New Zealand, that's about as important you can get because our economy is largely agricultural based. And so our pitch was we had a low risk solution to a high risk issue. That's it. Then in our thing we say, the reason we're a low risk solution to a high risk issue is because uh, we've got an experienced team. We've got all three components of this thing covered where we knew no one else did. And what that means to you is there are no gaps for anything to fall between. We cover the lot. All right. And then we go on to say, and we're really experienced. We've been doing this and here's our team and all that sort of stuff. But the pitch was really important. So one your guys could use is – and I, and I stumbled across this. I was working with a client. They were a, a training organization, and I was trying to think one up for them, and I pulled up at a set of traffic lights, and there was a billboard with my answer. And it was about a travel thing, but it was the best experience. You know, you imagine, as an architect, the best experience. We bring the best of our experience to give you the best experience. That means that if you engage with us, it's low risk, it's comfortable, we'll keep you informed, uh, there's no surprises, and you get a great outcome. So not only do you, does the end result a great experience, but the process we took you through was the best experience because of our best experience. You know, how's that a story for helping you win a bid in your space? You know, I think it's a great story. <laughs> Love it. So, yeah. So be clear what's special about you. Um, write it succinctly in bullet points. Um when you're making statements, flesh them out a bit too and what this means to you is, you know, the, the test is the so what test. When you read it, so what? You know, and then what we do is come up with a pitch uh, for that particular project and, and then just tie that into our theme. That's our theme for this one. Um, don't clutter your proposals with detail but if you're going to have detail, put it in the appendices so they, the detail-orientated person assessing your proposal can look at that in the appendix without clouding your key messages. So you have the key messages up front, detail back there. Because we lost one once where they said you didn't have enough detail. 
man, this was one where we're the incumbent. We were doing it. Mm. You know, and it's like, oh, didn't you know? So, oh, no, well, you didn't really show that, you know. Oh, great. Um, and uh, make that assessment too on have you got a relationship with them. If you haven't, it's really hard work to win these things. And so if you haven't, you've got to try and work, find out some other way of making a relationship with them, which might come back over to that free added value things. You've given them 10 tips of things to look out for when you're building a building, 10 things to look out for you when you're engaging an architect, whatever those things are. So you're giving them those and building up your reputation without spending any money and time. Then when they come to you, they go, oh, yeah, that's those guys, right? Yeah, yeah, now I know them. So you've got a bit of a relationship. Wonderful. Does that help? That does. <laughs> Thanks, Frank. So we're I'm going to be putting information on this podcast episode about where people can get a hold of the Right Track Workshop, uh, some of the trainings that you produce, and I think that'll be hugely valuable for our listeners. Yeah, so what, what we've done too, because um, – there's a saying in training, it's seven times told. You know, you've got to tell people seven times before it sort of gets in and gets ingrained. And and then, you know, they've got to actually do it before it gets ingrained. Um, so any of those that got kids, uh, I've just told you a lie. Kids, anything from 37 to 137 yeah. <laughs> times that you've got to tell them before it goes in, right? Well, you know, you have go. you made your bed, yeah? Yep. Yeah, but so so what, what we've created and uh, for the people that I'm training um, uh, on my day-to-day training and then, you know, that the likes of you guys can use as a a video training uh, workshop. It's broken down into a number of um, sort of segments that are bite-sized chunks, but covering off really what we've been talking about today because even the guys that come to my two-day training, um, they need some reinforcement. So we've created this video and and we've um, put some stuff in it, a version for you about architects uh, so that A, you can – see this in your own time, have a go, practice, have a go, practice, have a go, practice, because that negotiating psychology, you know, I've negotiated over 300 commercial contracts now, and the breakthrough for me was when I got uh, the Neil Rackham uh, tape, this was back in the days of tapes, that's how far long ago this was, and I just went over and over and over, and I'd go and have a go, boy, that didn't work, go back, listen to the tape again, go and have another go until the point that that became second nature and ingrained in my being. And so that's why we've created some uh, video training so that uh, the likes of you guys, they can get it, have a go, get it, have a go. Re- oh, you know. So persevere with stuff until you get it is, my, is the other key message there. Excellent. So for those of you who want to check that out, this training that, that Frank is telling us about, go to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash right track. So it'll be one word, businessofarchitecture.com forward slash right track, and it will take you to that webpage. Thanks you, Frank, for being on the show today. It's been, it's been great coming on here, and I'm glad I was able to dig out a lot of value for our listeners. Hopefully they enjoy it. <laughs> okay. Yeah, no, that's great, uh, Enoch, and it's been my pleasure. And it's, uh, uh, but it's also you certainly um, went in some areas that I wasn't expecting today. So you got some, uh, some uh, lessons and how to win bids and things. And and you know, just wish your guys all all the best of luck. Really, this is ongoing learning. It, it's uh, um, we're still learning. I have three or four coaches myself, and uh, we're learning new stuff every day. Frank Aldrich has prepared a training course on how you can run a right track workshop to make the process of breaking into a new industry or forming relationships with a new organization smoother, you can get that by going to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash right track. That's one word, businessofarchitecture.com forward slash right track. And that's a wrap for another show about the business of architecture. To get more resources about how you, as an architect, can run a rewarding business that is both fun, flexible, and profitable, visit businessofarchitecture.com and click the Join button to claim your free account to Business of Architecture Insider. As a member, you'll have access to free tools and resources to help you get more clients, start a new firm, and much more. You'll also get access to my book, Social Media for Architects, where you'll learn how to use Internet tools for fun and for profit. Until next week, this has been The Business of Architecture.
views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Bump music credit to Ben Folds 5, Do It Anyway.